So to our to our two keynote speakers, um, both have reached you know, the high echelons of uh, of their professions. One in the corporate sector, one in the in the uh, public service sector through the military. But both experienced very different journeys when it came to coming out, both in terms of process and also in terms of timing. Lord Brown of Mattingly is the former CEO of BP, and I think the most common asked question this morning has been, when were you last in the Shell offices? <laughs> um, so uh, former CEO of British Petroleum, a uh, position that you held for 12 years. Um, he was also the company's head of exploration and production. And when you think about what that role entails, traveling the world, who, who you have to meet with, and then the story we're about to hear, it's an interesting position to have had. Um, where uh, in that role had to engage and negotiate with world leaders and ministers you know, to gain access to the resources of those countries so that they could be turned into, into profits. Um, during his 41 years uh, career with uh, BP, John traveled the world a career full of adventure which, and I, I like the quote in your first book, included going toe-to-toe -to -toe with tyrants, despots, and elected leaders while bringing them around to develop and maintain, good and, um, maintain great business opportunities that were good for their own societies. And all of this whilst keeping a secret. In 2007, John was, and again a term that I liked in a recent article, was pulled out of the closet and today finds himself as one of the few top corporate executives, past or present, that is out. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I invite Lord Brown of Mattingly. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, the answer to the question was uh, that I was here to see the former uh, CEO of Shell, Haroon van der Veer, and the security was much tighter than it was this morning. Uh, so, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be back uh, at Shell, uh, a company I've admired, uh, and they probably know this, uh, for a very long time, and a company uh, uh, upon which BP modeled many of the things it did while I ran it. So, thank you for that. Uh, I'm here to talk about one topic today, uh, and that's about being gay in business. Uh, I was into, I've been on the road uh, talking about a book I've just brought out called The Glass Closet, uh, and this morning I know that I, at least I can keep on topic. I was interviewed by uh, several, many people, and uh, one interview, it was very clear that the interviewer was completely uninterested in being gay in business. So having gone through three questions, in a, an amazing step, he, the next question was, and do you think fracking is the right thing to be doing in Europe? <laughs> uh, and uh, I concluded, I was trying to figure out how you could connect the two, <laughs> but uh, we'll figure it out later. Um, I, I thought this morning I'd talk about just three things, if I may, because I don't know uh, many people in this audience. I talk a little bit about myself, uh, about uh, why, I was, why I wrote this book, uh, a bit about what I found out, uh, which is the vast bulk of this book about other people, and then a little bit about leadership, uh, and in particular in the corporate sector. Because my experience only is in the corporate sector, so I can't talk about sport and media uh, and entertainment, but I think I can reasonably talk about the corporate sector. You may or may not know that uh, I'm probably the oldest person in this room. I might actually just be that. Uh, but when I, when, I started, uh, when I started in university, uh, being, a, being gay and doing anything about it uh, was, of course, com was a criminal act in the United Kingdom. And it was so until 1967, uh, 10 years after the publication of the Wolfenden Report, uh, and probably only enacted when his son, who was gay, committed suicide. So uh, I started life then, but I also started as the, the son of a mother who had uh, survived uh, Auschwitz. And she had a couple of messages that I think she always talked to me about. One was, uh, 
never tell anyone a secret because they will always use it against you. And secondly, never be a visible member of a minority because when the going gets tough, they get persecuted. And that, I think, was uh, based on experience. And it suffused my life. And so when I uh, turned up at uh, university, it was obvious that I was going to be, uh, I was not going to be out. I keep that a secret. And I would have a public life and a private life, and never the two will meet. And actually, I found that kind of fun. It was sort of a bit like James Bond. You know, you could sort of figure out a legend and have something different. So I did that, and I carried on the two lives, keeping a very big secret to myself for my entire existence in BP. I expect a lot of people knew, thought uh, that I might be gay, uh, uh, but uh, you know, as you rise up uh, in an organization, in spite of the fact no one believes in authority, they at least give you some respect and deference. So they never actually ever asked a question. And occasionally, when it possibly came up, uh, my very wise PR manager, who was incredibly wise and very British, never said a thing, just knew how to handle people away. But that was then, and this is not now. Uh, but in 2007, uh, uh, as I was coming back from vacation, a former boyfriend of mine decided to sell the, a story to the Daily Mail. And it was literally the kiss and tell story uh, of all time, uh, and a uh, lot, lot. So I decided in those days, it was 2007, uh, to seek an injunction, uh, a super injunction, which meant everybody was bound, they couldn't say anything. And in so doing, I told a lie about, uh, to my lawyers about how I'd met this guy, because I couldn't bring myself to say that I'd met him on an escort website. But actually, I said I'd met him training in a park, which was a cover story we'd used. I reversed that statement very quickly. But then uh, the fight and debate to keep the injunction in place was an amazing fight. No one saw what was going on. I believe the role of leadership is to actually be who you are, be who you are as a leader, never showing uh, personal difficulties when you can't share with people what those difficulties are. You can't go around just looking miserable unless you say, well, actually, I'm miserable because something happened. And if you can't say what happened, then don't look miserable. So I, I, tried, to, uh, I tried to keep uh, all that surface uh, perfect. Uh, and uh, I realized uh, very quickly that uh, if this uh, injunction fell, I, I should go. And so on May the 1st, 2007, without any explanation, without any further pre-warning, I should say, uh, to my board, I resigned. A and I didn't ask if I should resign. I just resigned a and uh, walked out of the front of the BP building to a very large number of cameras uh, and spent three days in sort of being chased by paparazzi. I never, I do not recommend that uh, to anybody. It's not very good. Uh, so. On the basis of this short uh, pit, potted history, one of the things I was determined was that no one would ever go through what I went through, and no one would ever think that it's wise uh, to run two lives, both of which will, in the end, come together. And it's very difficult to get out of two lives the higher you get up in an organization, because, as it were, you've invested in both of them. And to disinvest means to do something which, which actually demonstrates very quickly your inauthentic behavior. And I was inauthentic. And this is one of my first regrets is if I could play it all over again, wouldn't it be nice to have been much more open with people? Because as one of my longstanding friends who I discovered uh, when I was writing this book, uh, a woman who's bisexual, who was married, is married to a former boss of mine, uh, who was one of my first bosses in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, uh, said to me, oh, well, she said, you know, you were really reserved. And she said, I mean that 
both in the UK and US meaning of the word. She said, we had no idea what was going on behind the business face. No idea at all. And that made you a little difficult to deal with, uh, which I think a lot of people would say that was the case. It turned out, incidentally, uh, and they live in the Napa Valley now, it turned out that she was uh, the editor of a, a magazine called Lunch, which I don't expect anyone here has seen, but it was the original campaign magazine for the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, CAG. And I had no idea. She and her first interview subject was David Hockney. So it was an amazing discovery to discover someone with that sort of depth of history. So the book I wrote also looked at, uh, asked, I was asking some, unusual, some questions to myself, which is, while there may be some, uh, an out gay CEO in the FTSE 100, actually in the S&P 700, there is no out gay CEO. This is a measure of the large corporations headquartered in the United States or, or listed in the United States, which I found statistically difficult to believe. I mean, it just seems unlikely. I mean, I'm, I'm a scientist, so I deal with probabilities, but it seems vanishingly unlikely that this is a true reflection of what is. And secondly, I was also struck by people I had conversations with who said, being LGBT in a society, no longer an issue. I, mean, I was talking to people just after uh, we'd passed uh, the, the law to uh, allow same-sex marriage. Uh, I was sitting in the House of Lords and I was doing quite a bit on that. And people said, well, there we're done, you see? Everything's done, no problem, and we don't know what, what no issues. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that's really the case. Uh, I don't think so but a lot of people do. And I think maybe sitting in a bubble in uh, Whitehall in London, you might well think that's the case. Or sitting in New York, you might well think that's the case. You just need to move to Watford or to just outside Brooklyn and there'll be a different uh, situation. So I was then pushed by a friend of mine, I've got to write a book just to see how you could help people. So. I, I went with a great researcher and interviewed well over 100 people. And I found some very extraordinary things, which may be uh, uh, some examples, not necessarily in this room, but in other rooms. The first thing which struck me, the most extraordinary thing I discovered was something I probably should have known, is I thought that everybody under 30 would be out and open in the workplace. I was sort of convinced that, you know, this is, uh, I'm a dinosaur, you know, this is the new generation, it's obvious, and how wrong I was, how, how wrong I was, and how much uh, fear uh, existed, how much fear existed in the minds of so many people we interviewed. In fact, they all wanted to be anonymous, these people, and, and there's a limit to the number of anonymous interviews you can put in a book, otherwise people say, have you made it up? You know, but uh, I, there was one story. We actually interviewed a, a, a person. I can't even say which sex, a person. And we had to, in order to interview, uh, we were told, you know, it was virtually, I'm caricaturing, take the number seven bus to the third stop, change, get on the 14, and go to the fifth stop, sit in a cafe reading the uh, Times, and, and someone will come in wearing a red carnation. And then we'll both go to a second cafe to have the interview. And it'll be miles away from my office. That's the sort of thing. We had people who, when we read back interviews, would say things like, uh, you mean you're saying I live in London? You can't do that. They may be able to identify me. I mean, there are 10 million people in London. <laughs> so I, I say this because the question is, is why? And, and the common themes were pretty obvious. First is, I don't want to be caricatured. I don't want this to get in the way of my promotion. I don't know whether it will or not. And I don't want my peers to use this as a weakness in order to exploit me in some way. And those, I think, were sort of common fears uh, of many, many young people uh, that we talked to. 
we equally talked to many people who had, uh, who had, had a, a completely symmetric whole self life in corporations. And they'd come and they'd done wonderful things and they'd been themselves in the workplace and to a person would say, and my productivity has risen because I was able to actually participate fully in the life of a society and all business is a society. And that I think is really important. Every study shows that when people bring their whole selves to work, uh, you know, the amount of uh, energy uh, and the amount of innovation goes up. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, many people would say the following, and don't take me incorrectly. Uh, since I'm a member of two minorities, I believe I'm equally qualified to say this, that it's broadly the case that members of minorities overachieve in order to compensate the fact that they're actually in uh, minorities. And uh, so in, in getting minorities to work really well, you tend to get a better uh, package on average uh, inside a corporation. So these are very important, I think, points that, that came through uh, the interviews. I was also surprised uh, to find out uh, one other point, which was this that in speaking to the few sportsmen who are out, uh, uh, sports people, I should say, because it was Martina also, very few people, uh, uh, they would say the following. The reason why we didn't come out, most of them, until we retired, was that if the team lost, they would all point at me and say that I'm the reason for the loss, because I'm the weak link in the chain. And uh, my, my friend, who's the, uh, uh, the Bundesliga uh, footballer, uh, who I talk about in my book, was, I think, the person who really said, you know, believe me, this is not about fans, this is about teams. And teams are a very important theme, I think, in trying to get this right. I've got a few more minutes. So the final point I want to make is this. It's all right, I just deliver on time, I hope. Uh, the final point I want to make is, is this. It's about uh, leadership. I, I think whenever you look at a, a company, uh, a corporation, in order to get anything done, you've got to translate whatever you want into the language of business. It's, it's antithetical to be in business and talk in a language that doesn't work in a business framework because everyone comes to a place of business to do something which is productive for the business. Those in the outside world would say, who are not in corporate life, would say, absolutely, and your business is the following, to maximize short-term profits and keep yourselves out of jail. <laughs> Only two, two objectives. I think that's not right. Uh, and I expect, I would hope, that most people here don't share that view of corporations, although we've got a lot, to, lot of work to do to make sure other people uh, don't share that view of corporations. But the, 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 what happens in a corporation is complex, in my view, and it, but it does, however you slice it, start with what is the leader, and I mean the position of the leader, leader after leader, wants to have achieved. And again, in my experience, and I've sat on lots of boards and run a big company, is, and I talk, criticize myself as well in this, is that leaders feel impelled to use the language of hard edge strategy and performance in all matters and squeeze out human matters in most of their target setting and dialogue. And the reason they do that is, of course, the pressures from the outside world. And they think, you know, one size fits all. But actually, it's not necessary. It's never necessary for the leader to spend all that time talking about profitability. There are plenty of other people around the leader who will do that. And actually, it's not necessary to talk about it internally that much, because it's part and parcel of performance. But by doing that, they squeeze out the time 
they could spend talking about the team. A and the team is, of course, the most important thing. I mean, I sit in my private equity guys and remind myself that the only thing I'm really doing is picking people. I'm only looking at teams. And actually, I think when I reflect on BP, I spent more time doing that. I did it by being in the closet as well, but nonetheless, picking teams is the most important thing and talking to the team. So leaders have to spend a lot of time being unremittingly committed, and I do stress unremittingly committed, to all dimension of, of inclusion. And unremitting means unremitting. In other words, they have to say what they want, establish a metric, usually survey-based, and go around and saying, why is it not working? Tell me about this. Tell me about this again and again. And things, surprisingly, move. They always do. They always move. But the most important thing, and again, when I talk to lots of companies, is they say, well, it's fine the leader's saying that, but nothing's happening. You know, there's a big, as always, the story of the middle. Uh, it's tough to penetrate the middle. The answer is everybody's a leader, and you've got to keep pushing everybody to say the same thing. To me, that's really important. I think the second thing which is really important in this area is for people to have role models. I, I, I think in any walk of life, if you can identify a little piece of yourself in somebody else, it gives you confidence and security that you're doing the right thing. And actually also might remind you that mistakes are made and life is not perfect. But I, I think identifying and having the role models is really important indeed. So my book is about all these things. Uh, the clock is two minutes to 10. Uh, I think I've finished on just one, one thing. First, I, I do think I don't want people to repeat what I did. I think it's not a good idea. Secondly, if anyone thinks this is a business which is finished, they need to think again. Thirdly, leaders need to work very, very hard indeed, both in their own signaling and picking and talking about role models. And my final fourth point, because I always give four points, is if we think that um, if we think we have a complex life here, of course, it's much bigger complexity outside. I'm struck by the fact that of the 77 countries where homosexuality is illegal and, and or a capital crime, fully half of them, of course, were mem former members of the British Empire. It was one of the great export things that uh, Britain did, uh, was to send a bunch of laws to people, and the only problem is they didn't send the maintenance kit with it. Uh, and so it stays there, and it's fossilized. It's very important that we just remember that if we think there are any problems around here, we might just reflect on the very large problems that so many people have in the world. I think it will give us a sense of place and position which is much more appropriate for people who should uh, behave with dignity. Thank you very much.